So we got the velocity, that's r dot, acceleration, that's r double dot, so that's a. All right, speed, all we're gonna do for speed is normalize velocity. Or not normalize, but find the magnitude of velocity. I'm gonna use the rightmost version of velocity because it already has that two factored out. It's a little less computation. So first thing we're gonna do is move the scalar outside. Now it comes outside as the absolute value, which is just positive two. And what we're left with, we're squaring the x, y, z components. Sine squared plus cos squared. Now the last term, we gotta square the negative five and the cos t sine t. So it's going to be plus five squared, cos squared, sine squared, cos t squared, sine, cos squared t, sine squared t. What reduction can we do here? Sine squared plus cos squared. So sine squared plus cos squared is one. So this will turn into one plus five squared. I don't think there's really anything else we can do. So this is speed. All right, unit velocity. So that means normalized velocity. So we got speed, so our unit velocity. So it's V over magnitude V. You can distribute the scalar, definitely the twos cancel. You can distribute that scalar, but that'll be even worse to write all that stuff out. So I think that's probably the easiest version right there to work with. All right, last thing, we wanna know when does the particle experience maximum acceleration? So we're gonna do, we wanna maximize acceleration. So we wanna know when the acceleration vector is the longest. So we're gonna normalize acceleration, that'll be the length. <coughs> so it's the magnitude of R double dot, zoom back out to see that. So I am using the upper right corner, that version of R double dot. We're finding the magnitude, so we'll bring that two outside. And I'm just gonna go ahead and square root. So I'm x component squared is cos squared t plus sine squared t. Now the last term, I have five squared times sine squared minus cos squared whole thing squared. So I'm just taking all those components and squaring them. And again, we're gonna have cos squared plus sine squared reducing to one. So when I square sine squared minus cos squared, this is a binomial, so we're gonna get sine to the fourth. minus two sine squared cos squared.
plus cos to the fourth t. All right, I don't really want sine squares and cos squares all mixed together. I don't see any real good simplification other than factoring back to what we had before. So I like to get all this down to just sines or cosines. How can I reduce sine squared minus cos squared to, let's go down to just cosines. So sine squared, one minus cos squared t. So we'll do that, so at least we'll just be dealing with cosines. Because I already tried to expand it, nothing else is going to cancel out, so let's just shift down to all cosines. So we got 1 minus cos squared minus cos squared, that's 1 minus 2 cos squared t. That seems kind of familiar. I think if it was just one minus cos, isn't this like cos two theta? I think there's an obscure identity. I think there's a nice double angle for this. We're gonna dig way back. Let's just leave it like this for now. We'll probably need to come back for that. All right, so here's the acceleration right here, the magnitude of the acceleration. How do we maximize this value? How do we maximize a function value? This is a real value function. So we're gonna set something to zero but if I just set it to zero now, I'd find the t value that gives me the smallest magnitude. So I want to take a derivative and set the derivative equal to zero. So we want to maximize a real valued function. So let's give it another name. I'll just call this f of t. So let f of t equal the magnitude of a, which is two square root and plus five squared one minus two cos squared t squared. And I want to maximize f of t. So what we're going to do is find f prime, set it equal to zero. This gets way back to, I don't know we did very much of this in calculus two. This goes way back to calculus one class. We're basically finding, this is called a critical value, and it's gonna be a local min or a local max. Is it just cosine of two T? Unfortunately, I don't have my cheat sheet with me. So that's the one that we know we've used. So we're going to multiply by 2. So we get 2 cos squared x and then subtract 1. And then multiply by negative 1.
All right, so we can replace the one minus two cos squared x by just negative cos two x. So we're gonna make that substitution up top. So we get two square root one plus five squared times negative cos two t. Squared, and we square that out, that negative won't matter. Oh, I think I made a horrible mistake. Or did I? Go square. So I have a lot of factor the two out. Okay, maybe I didn't. I was worried I wouldn't be able to factor the two out, but a third term picked up a two off the power. All right, so this is the function we want to maximize. So we're about to take the derivative and set the derivative to zero. All right, before we do that, if we maximize the function, that's the same as maximizing a square root of a function. So if we find the value that maximizes the square root of a function, that's the same as the value that would maximize the square of the function. So what we can do is find the t value that maximizes the inside of that square root. And if we maximize the inside value, we'll also maximize the square root value. So let's just make it a little bit more simple so the chain rule is less obnoxious. So I'm going to let g of t equal just the inside part. And 5 squared cos squared 2t. So we're going to set 0 to equal the derivative. So that 1 disappears. We have 5 squared times 2 cos 2t, right. I'm going to use the easier power for calculus, power notation for calculus, so I brought that 2 in front. We got cos 2t times derivative, which is negative sine 2t, so that takes care of the cosine function, now times 2t, which is 2. So we got 4 times 25, that's 2 squared times 5 squared. Cos 2t sine 2t, somewhere it's negative equals 0. So that number in front doesn't matter. All right, so 0 equals cos 2t times sine 2t. So we're going to use zero product property. So either cos 2t equals 0 or sine 2t equals 0. So there's going to be an infinite number of <coughs> infinite number of solutions. So I'll write the four points on the unit circle that correspond to those values. So cos 2t is 0 when t is pi over 2 plus 
2 pi k or t equals 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So that's cosine 2t equaling 0. So those are each 2t. And then sine equaling 0, it's either 0 or pi. So 2t equals 0 plus 2 pi k, or 2t is pi plus 2 pi k. So let's combine all four of these together. We have 2t equals, we'll go with 0 plus pi over 2k. So all I did was looked at my unit circle. They're all evenly spaced out, so I just picked the first one and then added a quarter rotation onto there. And then a regular t is pi over 4k. Any k and z. I probably shouldn't use k because we're using ijk notation. So let's go pi over 4n for any n in Z. All right, so any questions on Computing that right there. So we could go and try to draw the curve. I'm just going to look at the original function. Trying the curve is going to be a little bit of a pain. So here's the original function at the top of the screen. All right, x and y act in a very normal way, just rotating around in a circle. So you can tell just by looking that the x and y components, the acceleration should be the same all the way around. You're just going in a constant circle. Now what's happening as you're spinning in that circle, the z-coordinate is 5 cos squared t. So the z-coordinate is sort of oscillating up and down. Now we know that cosine squared is never going to be negative. So your lowest z-coordinate is 0. Your highest z-coordinate would be 5. And you just kind of jump up and down. So it really comes down to the z-coordinate. You could figure out when's the mass maximum acceleration on just the z-coordinate, and you should come up with the same answer. So that would be the second derivative of this z-component, and you could compute all that, and you should get the same t-value. So as you can tell, computations can get pretty... Uh, intensive when you compute them all the way out because there's basically three components in functions and anytime you're going to take a uh, magnitude you're going to get some crazy square roots with squared stuff all over the place hopefully things cancel out you're going to see a lot of sine squares plus cos squares canceling be ready for that so we're ready to write down our vector derivative rules Let's take our scalar function to be alpha. So alpha is going to go from r1 into r1. And then our vector functions will be u and v. And they'll go from r1 into rn. And all these are going to be t derivatives. So derivative of a constant, so c will be a constant. And the way we'll write a constant, here's a constant vector, c. So what is the derivative of a vector that's not changing over time? It'll be the zero vector. So that's the derivative of a constant vector. So 
So now we're looking at derivative of a constant vector times a function of t. Now, this is a product, so I could write out the full product rule, which I will over on further to the right. So it's a derivative of c times the scalar function f of t plus the vector c times the derivative of the I told you I would use alpha, and I'm using f instead. So let's change this f out to be an alpha. All right, so the left derivative of the constant vector function is 0 times any number is a 0 vector, plus on the right side, that c alpha prime of t. So we got the zero vector plus something out, some other vector, so the zero vector doesn't matter. So we're just going to get c times alpha prime of t. Hey, it spells cat. All right, so we have cat. Next up. So we'll look at alpha times u. So again, alpha is a scalar function. So this obeys the product rule, just like the previous one did, but this product rule won't reduce uh, to a zero term. So we'll get derivative of the t derivative of alpha, that's alpha prime u plus alpha u prime. So that's product rule. Now there's going to be two other product rules. One of them is the dot product rule. The other one is the cross product rule. So this is the scalar product rule. Now we have the sum rule. Sum or difference rule. So it is the regular one you're remembering. Some rule. All right, the two product rules. We'll start with dot product u dot v. All right, take a guess of what you think it is. It's product rule, or dot product rule specifically. So u prime dot v plus u dot v prime. So that is the product rule right there. You're just keeping the same product. Before in the scalar product rule, we just had scalar products. So at the top of the board, scalar product and then other scalar product. All we have here is dot product, other dot product. And our last product is the cross product. And you should be able to guess the cross product now that you've seen the dot product rule. This is the cross product rule. And just be careful with the cross product, you can't change the order. Dot product, you can switch the order, but cross product is very important. You don't change the order that you're multiplying. So cross product, the u is first, so u prime and u have to be first when you apply that product rule. Dot product doesn't matter because you can change the order. All right, one more rule, the chain rule. Ooh, it should be an alpha. All right, let's look at this function composition that's happening here. Alpha, uh, t is a scalar, or a real value. 
alpha of t is also a real value, and that's fine because the input of the u function is a real number as well. So this order of composing u of alpha makes sense. So what we get is u prime of alpha of t times alpha prime of t. So that's the chain rule. Let's compose them in the other way. If we take u of t, we get a vector, and alpha can't eat vectors. So that doesn't make any sense to feed alpha a vector. So the order is super important. So alpha cannot eat vectors. Since we said alpha goes from numbers to numbers, that was written above. Now we're going to look at vector functions of constant length. So that's the end of the algebraic properties right there. So if your vector function is constant length 0, that's a very boring function. It's not moving anywhere. So we're going to assume that our constant length is not 0. So we'll suppose r of t magnitude is equal to a constant, and that constant is not 0. How does a dot product of r with itself relate to the magnitude? It is the magnitude squared, which of course, written right above, the magnitude is c, so the magnitude squared is c squared. So we'll take a derivative now. derivative, we're going to have r prime t dot r of t plus r of t dot r prime of t equals derivative of a constant is 0. Now, the way I wrote c at the top of the board where c was first introduced, is c a number or a vector? The way it's written should be able to tell. So it's a number. Two reasons it's a number. It's a magnitude. I also compared it to zero. So for both of those reasons, it better be a number. So C is a number. So it makes sense to square a number. All right, R prime dot R plus R dot R prime. Those are commutative. So we have two R prime dot R. We can reorder it. We have two of them equals 0, so divide both sides by 2. So if our vector function is constant length, if you take the dot product of the derivative with the original function, you should get 0. What geometric property can you say about two vectors whose dot product is zero? They have a very special relationship. Perpendicular, or the angle between them is always pi over two. So R and R prime are always perpendicular. 
This does not require uh, three dimensions. We did not use cross product. So what does this look like? We'll just draw in two dimensions. So this is not a unit circle, this is a radius of C circle. So if your vector function is constant length, it can point any direction it wants, but it's always have, having to be magnitude C. So it's going to always live on this circle right here. So wherever your function goes, it's going to, no matter what T value you have, it'll always be on this perfectly drawn circle. Right there. And let's think about a particular function value right here. So that'll be for some t value. Now, if your function is not moving, it's really boring. Your uh, derivative will just be zero. So your dot product will be zero. But let's assume that this function is actually moving. It can move in one of two ways. It can rotate upwards or rotate downwards. Let's pretend that it's rotating downwards. What will the derivative look like? So what I'll do is I'll draw, we'll say it's rotating downwards. The derivative is going to basically be in between those two. Now in order to actually find the derivative, you'd have to take the limit and apply the difference uh, quotient. But basically the derivative will look like that right there and be perpendicular. It only makes sense geometrically if you make that angle between the two infinitesimally small because the way I wrote it, that arrow is not quite tangent. The proper tangent arrow looks like that. Uh, but if you make your angle super small, you actually get a exact perpendicular tangent right there. So that's the geometry of why these two are perpendicular. We just did all the calculus computation, but that's the intuition you get by looking at a graph uh, of a vector with a constant magnitude. So we just looked at derivatives. Let's look at integrals. So we're going to use capital R for the antiderivative of little r. Now when I want to talk about real space, I'll make sure that I put a second vertical bar inside r. But we're just going to use big R for the antiderivative of little r. So I use the word and antiderivative because we know if you add a constant, you're still an antiderivative. So we're just going to say and antiderivative. So what does that mean? That means r prime, big R prime equals little r. Or the t derivative of big R equals little r. So if we use antiderivative notation, Antiderivative of little r dt is big R plus a constant. Both R and big R are, are vectors, so that means C in this case is a vector constant. So Z will be a, C will be a vector constant now. So we're going to find the integral of cos t i plus j minus 2 t k dt. There's lots of letters. We should know by now that cos, none of those letters are variables. 
how do I know that I, J, and K are not the variables in this particular antiderivative? The DT tells you T is a variable that we're going to integrate with. So that's super important as we get multiple letters appearing other places. So you don't want to be taking an I antiderivative or a J antiderivative. So we can write this as three separate integrals. There's an I integral. Now I is a constant. I could bring it out front. And I have cos T dt plus J times the integral dt. You can write a 1 in there, 1 dt minus 2k integral 1 dt. So all I did was I used the constant multiple and sum rule to break this up across uh, different parts. Oh, yes. There should definitely be a T right there. All right, so individually, these are super easy antiderivatives. So find them and write them down. They're all T antiderivatives. So I have three constants on the board. I better give them different names. So I have C1, C2, and C3. So I'm going to distribute my I, distribute my J, and then separate out my constant and my non-constants. So I have I sine t plus j t minus t squared, uh, k t squared plus, now all my constants, I have c1i plus c2j minus 2c3k. I like diamond notation, so I'm going to use that. Sine t, comma, t, comma, negative t squared, plus c1, comma, c2, comma, negative c3. I'm going to call this constant vector over here C. So I'll just call that whole constant vector C. So what I did is I obeyed all the regular derivative rules, just treating i, j, and k as constants. Wouldn't that be minus 2 C3? Yeah. So minus 3? Yeah, it should be a minus 2 C3. All right, so my constant vector C is C1, C2, comma, some other constant. So just three constants right there. All right, you can do this way, way faster. You can probably tell 
the antiderivative I'll write out in vector form cos t comma 1 comma negative 2t dt and then go right down to the very bottom right there you're just antiderivative 1 then the next then the next plus constant so do everybody a favor and use diamond brackets go the fast way all I did was show very carefully those constant multiple rules which you're going to shortcut right down to the bottom.